Good evening, uh, confirmation candidates. We have really progressed a long way. We are now coming towards the end of the confirmation classes. And also, we now come down to something which is very, very important in the next few weeks. So the first thing that we all have to know is that before we have our confirmation, we will have the sacrament of reconciliation. So we'll be having that topic this evening. So join your hands. And we begin with the prayer. O Lord Jesus Christ, who before ascending into heaven, did promise to send the Holy Spirit to finish thy work in school in the souls of thy apostles and disciples, deign to grant the same Holy Spirit to me, that he may make perfect in my soul the works of thy grace and my love. <clears throat> grant me the spirit of wisdom, that I may despise the perishable things of this world and aspire only after the things that are eternal. The spirit of understanding, to enlighten my mind with the light of divine truth. The spirit of counsel, that I may ever choose the surest way of pleasing God and gaining heaven. The spirit of fortitude, that I may ever bear my cross with thee that I may overcome with courage all the obstacles that oppose my salvation, the spirit of knowledge that I may know God and know myself and grow perfect in the science of the saints, the spirit of piety, that I may find the service of God sweet and amiable, the spirit of fear, that I may be filled with loving reverence towards God and may dread in any way to displease him. Mark me, dear Lord, with the sign of thy true disciple, and animate me in all things with thy spirit. Amen. My dear candidates, <clears throat> paintings speak to us in different ways, and that one of the great, greatest artists, why they are artists, because their paintings speak to us forever and a day. The painting that you see right now is The Return of the Prodigal Son, it's a painting based on the story that you have heard in the Gospel, Luke 15, The Prodigal Son. But this painting is amazing because you're going to see why in a few minutes. And you'll be watching a video right now. You are looking at a painting entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son by the 17th century Dutch artist Rembrandt. It was inspired by the story about the lost son from Luke's Gospel. Apparently, Rembrandt was quite taken with the story, and there are multiple sketches of different scenes from this story in Rembrandt's archives from throughout his life. This fascination with the story culminated in this painting, one of Rembrandt's final masterpieces the work of an old man who could look back on his life and sympathize with all of the main characters of the story in some way. For those not familiar with the story, I will summarize. A wealthy man has two sons. The younger one, who by law has no right to his father's inheritance, asks for his share of the inheritance while his father is still living. He then takes the money and spends it on booze and prostitutes. Broke, with nowhere to stay, the young man takes a job working with swine an animal Luke's audience knew was unclean under Jewish law. To emphasize the young man's desperation, Luke tells us that he envies the pigs and the food that they eat. Eventually, he decides to go home and beg his father's forgiveness, not because he is sorry, but because he is hungry. As he is walking up the road to his father's house, rehearsing his sob story in his head, the father sees him, runs to him, embraces him, forgives him, and calls for a celebratory feast for the lost son who has returned. The older brother sees this happen and throws a fit, which is completely understandable since he has been a good son his whole life and as a rotten little brother is having a party thrown for him. Rembrandt's painting captures that moment when the son returns. Let's take a look. The father and the lost son are bathed in light in what is a pretty dimly lit scene. The young son is on his knees his head leaning against the father's chest. Whereas the father and older son are dressed in red, a sign of their wealth, 
The younger is now in rags. His left shoe has fallen off. His right shoe has a giant hole near the heel, both feet beaten up by a long journey. Whereas most men of the time had longer hair, the younger barely has any, but not because he is bald or balding. It looks as if his hair was sloppily cut, maybe in an attempt to remove lice or fleas. The father embraces him, even in this wretched condition. Critics often focus special attention on the father's hands, which appear asymmetrical. The left hand is wider, with thicker fingers, a man's hand, which is gripping the younger son's shoulder the way dads do. The right hand, however, appears more feminine, smoother, with long, thin fingers, and this hand rests lightly between the son's shoulder blades, like a mother's gentle touch. Those hands, both mother and father, represent the love and compassion of a God who cannot be confined by gender roles or stereotypes, but who embodies the fullness of all that is good in us, whether male or female, and all we are called to be, whether male or female. A God who will welcome us home, no matter how far we have gone astray. On the right side of the painting, standing upright, maybe uptight, is the older brother, the good and dependable son. Notice the look on his face, the way he holds his hands. Is he touched by the moment, bowing his head and folding his hands out of reverence as he witnesses this beautiful moment? Or is he enraged, clenching both his teeth and his fists, since this sinner is being rewarded with a feast? How would you feel about this situation, about this brother who lived a careless life, being forgiven and welcomed back by a father who seems to be careless with his love? Henry Nouwen, a Catholic priest who wrote a book on this painting and this story, asks us to look at the painting and insert ourselves. Are we more often the older brother or the younger? Nouwen says, Rembrandt is as much the elder son of the parable as he is the younger. When during the last years of his life he painted both sons in Return of the Prodigal Son, he had lived a life in which neither the lostness of the younger son nor the lostness of the elder son was alien to him. Both needed healing and forgiveness. Both needed to come home. Both needed the embrace of a forgiving father. But from the story itself, as well as from Rembrandt's painting, it is clear that the hardest conversion to go through is the conversion of the one who stayed home. Sometimes it is hardest to forgive. Sometimes the hardest task is not to judge those who have erred. That is why Nowen reminds us, whether you are the younger son or the older son, you have to realize that you are called to become the father. Look at the father in the painting, and you will know who you are called to be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please forgive us when we have taken your love for granted, and when we have strayed from the path of righteousness. Bless us so we can love like you, show mercy like you, and forgive like you so that we can join in that celebration at the end of time when all of us return home to you. Amen. Okay, having seen that video, I'm just going to run through a few things. This painting is by uh, Rembrandt that you already heard in the video. And Rembrandt has a very special way of painting what made Rembrandt so special was, especially those of you who are doing art and architecture and color fabrics and things like that. Look at the painting because Rembrandt introduced a new style of painting which had dark and light. And in the light were the main characters. So you can see the father, the son, and the eldest son. And in the background, you have darkness. So Rembrandt made it sure that his viewers would always see the people in the movie, in the picture, slide. So how many, next, click. So how many people are there in the picture? According to what you can see and I can see, it's actually three, four, five. And if you watch the video just now, they would say the sixth person is the mother who, cares for her son very much, but is too, uh, cannot get involved because that was not the role of the mother. Next. So who are the two people in red? 
Okay, the two people in red, one on the left is the father with his cloak, and on the right is the son. And some artists say the colors are same to show that they belong to the same family. Next. Check the postures of each of them. One, the father's bending down. I'll do that in detail just now. And the other is the far son, the eldest son, who is standing even on a pedestal and stiff, not even wants to get involved in this whole story. And then we're going to look at next the posture of the father and the elder son. And then we're going to see something more. What does this whole picture and what attitudes come across in this picture? All right. It's like when you're in school and you have to tell, read the picture and say what it says. But Rembrandt has far more to say as I go through. I'll explain this to you. Next. When we look at these two paintings close up, the face of the father is forgiving and concern. A look of sadness and at the same time, a look of serenity, calm, tenderness, gentleness. The face of the elder son is sad, but if you can see his jaw, even to that beard, it's tight-fisted. The tight lips that he's not too happy with what is happening. And you know the story that he was supposed to be the good guy and he's I never spent a lot of money. And now here the father is cutting the fatted calf and giving the treatment to his son who was um, squandered the property and so on. So many of us would be in that condition actually. Very often we want justice. Vengeance belongs to God. That's what the Psalm says. You may be angry, but uh, it says in this uh, book of Proverbs, the chariots are ready for war, but victory belongs to God. And so vengeance is always God. And somehow our human nature still wants to play God and say, I'll teach him a lesson. I'll show him and so on. So you can see these two faces, an expression of something totally different. Okay, next. When you look at the hands here, okay, we can see the contrast in the body language. Today, psychologists talk body language and so on. You can see the body language here. The father is bent forward to embrace his lost son. You know, someday you'll go for an interview and the way you sit, the person, the boss, the interviewer, and look how you sit. If you're sitting forward, you are more of an extrovert. You're ready to do things. You're ready to reach out and so on. But if you sit back with your hands on top and just relax, no? you have an attitude of arrogance and so on. You will learn this in time to come. But here the father is bent forward to embrace his lost son. Whereas the elder son is standing erect, as I said before, and far off. Even a little higher on another step, as you saw in the first picture. And standing up on a high little pedestal comes the impression is that I am better than you. I am higher than you. I am the good son. And so on. Const constant comparisons. And my uh, dear candidates, students, comparisons can lead to a lot of sinfulness, gossip, bitterness, all the seven capital sins you've already done. Some of its roots is in comparison when you speak so badly of other people. And here you can see total comparison. I got nothing to do with this fellow. Another difference is the father's hands are opened to welcome the son and to his life again. The eldest son's hands are closed. Can you see they are folded? and holding back a walking stick, a sign of closeness. And I am in authority here. I've got the walking stick in my hand, a sign of authority. Another thing to notice are the red cloaks. You see the father's cloak is open. And artists and great uh, uh, people who comment on art say, it's in the shape of a womb, welcoming that son who's there back into life. Come into my womb, come into my life come back into my life again, whereas the sun's cloak is more closed. Next. When you look at the picture of the hands, you've already seen the video clip. The Rembrandt has painted two hands. The right hand is basically, the right hand is basically a right hand of feminine, a feminine hand. 
feminine hand, sorry, feminine hand, female, feminine, and gentle, loving, caring. The left hand is masculine, strong. Can you see that? One is the right hand has got longer fingers. The left hand is stumpy. The left hand is broader. Signs of a hand of the masculine. But yet it's a, it's a reassuring. And God is like that. He's slow to anger, right hand, and abounding in love. And then both those hands are on the shoulder. Now, if you ever realize in your own life, even now if you're exhausted and tired and you think of pressing your shoulder blades, you can feel relaxed. And so all our tensions are built up around our neck muscles. And so that is why massages are good. And when people say, I pat you on the back, you feel wonderful. If you have lost someone and someone gives you a hug and they press that part of the body, certain amount of, which I will talk about, these built up stress hormones are built up there and they're released and so on. So you feel a lot of comfort. And this is what the father is doing to the son, holding him in both arms. I would like you to remember that that boy has come from the pig style. He's not had a bath. He's still stinking and smelling. But you think the father bothers about what he's gone through? No, he's my son. I love him. And he puts his hands around him and pat on the back. The boy, maybe according to Rembrandt, was kneeling down to ask for forgiveness. But the father is not prepared to ask. Remember in the story, it says, I know what I will do. I'll go back to my father and tell my father, Father, I have sinned. I have no longer wish to be your son. Treat me like a servant. But the father doesn't even listen. You can see here the boy's face, the younger son's face, is just lost in the folds of the garment. The father is not prepared to hear all that. You have come back and that's all that's important. We also notice the shaven head. As you heard, it may have been because of lies. But Henry Nouvet, who wrote this whole book out on this on this painting, okay, this painting is, is in St. Petersburg. It's a fantastic painting. And uh, I've got one, actually, if you look slightly behind me, there's a painting there of the same thing. And uh, it's a fantastic painting. And why this is so good, well, there's so much of symbolism in it. So Henry Nouvet said that head of the young man resembles the head of a newborn baby, a newborn baby or the head of a fetus, and that's a sign of new life. And as I told you earlier, the, the red cape is like the uh, shape of the womb. The father is pulling him into his abdomen as a sign of the womb so that the son can come back again and be born again. You hear that in John chapter 3 to be born again. And this is what God wants us, to come back, lice, at smelling, stinking, torn clothes, whatever your life is, God is calling you back. Next slide. Next. Okay, you. All right. Now to some background to this painting, you see Rembrandt, only one you understand Rembrandt's life, and his paintings, then you understand the impact of this story, of this painting, present painting. See, Rembrandt was a very good artist. He was one of the very few artists who already made a name when he was living. Not like other artists, now their paintings are selling for millions of pounds and dollars. No, Rembrandt was already recognized. He was a great artist. And he had a miserable life. He had a wife, then his wife died, later on his children died, and so on. But he had enough money to keep on and keep on going. And one time, he was so well to do that he painted this picture that you can see on the screen. It's the painting of the prodigal son. What I showed you earlier was the return of the prodigal son. Here, this painting painted in 1637 is the painting of the prodigal son. Now you can see it. it's like when you go for certain places, they show you the before and the after. So this is like the before. And the son goes out with his father's money 
and there he is, sees clothes, fantastic satins and silks, and so much of it that it's rolling up into folds, even his sleeves are big and so on. And then he's got this fantastic cap with perhaps an ostrich feather, which is a sign of regality, richness, nobility, etc. And then he's got his long curly hair. Now you saw the painting before, the other one, he's got no hair. So I'm just showing you the before and the after. And you can see Rembrandt's face here is delighted. Why? Because he's lifting a glass of beer and he's rejoicing and he is trying to fool around with that girl. Okay. In real life, that lady is his wife. Okay. She poses as a portrait for the painting. But besides that, I want you to notice a few things. One, the clothes. Two, the cap. Three, the long and curly hair, rich hair style. And most of all, the sword. You can see that big sword on the side because that is a sign of nobility. Okay, very important when you study the next picture or the previous picture of return of the prodigal son. So there's a sword here that shows that he belonged to royalty. He belonged to a regal family. He was a, not an ordinary person. He was of a higher middle class. That was the painting in 1637. But as Ramron went on to live, and after his wife died, then they're trying to bring up the children. The children died of various sicknesses and plagues. Rembrandt did not bother. He would paint, spend the money on what he got uh, on, on the painting, and then be a pauper. And then it went on in cycles of pauper and money, pauper and money, till it dawned on him on his last painting, which is The Return of the Prodigal Son, 32 years later. Next. Okay. Now look at that painting. See the head. Rembrandt felt like this at the end of his life. He actually felt like this. I have nothing left. My wife is gone. My children are gone. My money is gone. I am desperate. I need to return to the father. Okay, that's kind of a real life story. And you see the head here now with no hair. And you can see those arms around him. And all that, that he wants is to be included into the family again. I don't mind how I'm included, whether I'm a servant in this household, but I want to be a member of this household. You know, just to divert a little bit, you were welcome into the house of God with your baptism. And you can do what you want, you can run away, etc. But there comes a time when deep down you long forward to be back home, home into the father's bosom. And this is exactly what Rembrandt is showing us here. See the head into the father's abdomen, the open cloak, the father's hands of calm and serenity, face of calm and serenity, his hands stretching out. The father's not bothered about that man behind you saw sitting and looking at the thing must have been a friend see what's going to happen. He's not bothered about what the wife is saying behind there or the other servant there behind the father or the elder son. No, this son of mine was lost and now he is found. This son of mine with full attention. So now you can see why Rembrandt in his painting makes these two characters so much alive. Okay, next. Now you can see that in this painting, or the thing I was talking about, there's no hair on his head. He doesn't have rich clothes. But to prove that he is noble, otherwise he would be taken as a slave. If he was coming away from the big style and people saw him, he could be taken as a slave. Can you imagine if you were to come from a place far away from home with no You've shaved your head because of lies. Your clothes are tattered. You think someone's going to allow you to sit with, sit in the train with them? They'll say, Ari, jau, jau. That's it. They will keep you away. You can't say, oh, my father is so-and-so. No. By your appearances, they would push you away. And so the prodigal son holds on to two things. On to two things that he holds on to show that he's not a slave. One is the dagger he has in his 
uh, around his waist. Look at the picture in the left. It's right down the corner there, the dagger. So he must have sold a sword to rich to live, but he brought back a dagger. Nobody else can walk with a dagger in public except a royal or a high class person. So he claimed that I belong to uh, my father. And secondly, he kept his slippers. Look at the slippers. One is totally torn. The heel is worn out. The heel of his foot is cracked. The other slipper must have fell out because the proper straps are not there. But I am not giving up my slippers or my shoes because these are two signs of my right as a son of a noble man. Some way you must have heard, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God chose you before all time to be holy and blameless. And at the appropriate time, as St. Paul says, you were called to be a son and a daughter of God. And your parents heard that and they called you for baptism and they called you for confirmation. If you are sitting in confirmation classes just because you have to finish the lessons, then you're missing out on something. But if you understand what I'm saying right now, that you have a God who's going to protect you because of baptism and because of your confirmation, it is like the sandals and it is like the sword. God has given you that. Compare the two pictures right now. See Rembrandt, they're holding a glass of wine. Here you can't even see the boy's hand. Perhaps they are begging for mercy. They are Rem Rembrandt's hands are flying up. I can do everything. I'm everyone. Many of us think we are like that. You never know what's going to happen. Right? To see the clothes that he has and see the clothes this side, they're all tattered and torn. Okay, So you can see that yet the father, as I told you, for me it's so important that the father did not say, son, go and have a bath first. And then come and I'll hug you. No, I'm going to hug you even if you smell of the pigs, even if you smell of the pigsty and pigsty smell. Okay. And even if my your shoes got all the crap of the pigs on the floor, on my your shoes, whatever it is, you are my son. Okay. And that is how God treats you and me. Next. So you look at the picture in totality now you can see the striking differences because here now, whatever I told you makes sense. That is why for me, this picture has a lot of meaning. I actually took a trip purposely to go to Petersburg to see this painting. And I spent nearly one hour, two hours just in front of this picture. And every time I look at this picture, I get a more and deeper meaning. If you get a chance, to read a little book, it's about 25 30 pages. It's called The Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nouvet. Henry Nouvet was a broken person, he was a Jesuit priest who helped to set up the Vatican II. But then he was so disappointed with so many things that he went to America all the way from Norway. He left Norway disappointed, I don't want to meet anybody, and he went all the way to the United States. And in the orphanage, he saw this painting. And there he asked, what is this painting about? And the sister superior in the orphanage told him, you must go to St. Petersburg and see this painting. And he flew off to St. Petersburg. He spent approximately 15 days in front of this painting from 8 o'clock in the morning till the museum closed at 5 in the evening. 15 days. And after the fifth or sixth day, he started making notes. And those notes are in that book. It's a beautiful, enriching experience for the season of Advent or for the season of Lent. I read that book ever so often. And every time I said, I see something different in this painting. So this is what reconciliation is. Rembrandt found God in his paintings. You can find God any way. And God is calling you at any time, any way. Okay, next. Okay. Pope Francis just came out with a document called Fratelli Tutti. Okay, I put that lock there because when you see this PPT of this document, 
There are eight chapters and each chapter has got a symbol. And so according to the Pope and all the previous documents he has taken, he says the world today is so corrupt, so corrupt that it's impossible to move forward. There's a kind of a lock on the way the world is moving. We are not moving ahead, we are moving in circles and so on. And what I put in blue there are some things from what he says. If we want democracy, freedom, justice, we want meaning in our lives, then first and foremost, we've got to check, check the culture of waste. You know, we think like just by throwing a uh, wrap out of the window, it's okay. But it's your attitude that I can treat people like that. I don't need you. I can do what I want now. And look at the youth when they talk to people, elderly people. Oh, get lost then, they'll say. Okay, the other are standing there for the bus stop and an old man was pushing in. And a college student said, hey, the old man, just move one side. Okay. Instead of helping the old man into the bus. So you have this culture of waste. You're not important to me, so it's okay. Just like anything else, just go away. Sometimes we treat our parents like that. So we have all these kind of things that are happening. And then you also have your racism, unemployment, poverty, disparity of rights, and so on. And so in this book, in this letter, huge letter, not huge, eight chapters or eight paragraphs, he talks about how the world is closed because of the dark clouds. So we need, at the end of the book, the chapter eight, which I did in the church on one evening, is that we need to sit back and reflect and look at ourselves. Okay, next. So here we see that only the only way that we can learn to be uh, have a happy world is what Pope Francis quoted Fratelli Tutti, which is a poem of St. Francis of Assisi, which means we are all brothers and sisters. It's a lovely poem where he calls sister moon, brother sun, birds, flowers, all of us are nature, and that we can live in harmony, but on one condition that we live with love. If you can see this gentleman on the right hand side, I like what he says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. So I so, so, uh, so true. So often we see people on the other side, this is me. Because I cannot walk freely because the one I don't like is across the road. I become the prisoner, not him, because I have not learned to forgive. But if I've learned to forgive, I say, okay, fine. And I meet that person, say, hi, how are you? Even if he doesn't wish me, I have a sense of freedom. I'm not bound by that person. I so often go for parties or when you go for parties, if you want someone you didn't like, you move far away from that person. You wouldn't even dare to go close that way because that is how you become a prisoner. But the moment you learn to forgive, then everything happens, it falls into place. So the Pope has spoken about how we live in a world of sin. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so we see here we live in a world of sin. You can see corruption galore in the first picture. If you're listening to the news, people are criticizing Goa at the moment. The amount of money is passed under the tables. You can see here uh, everybody's looking straight forward, but everything is going behind the back, money and documents and so on. Then you also have murder, the chap with the axe, okay? Then you have violence and rape, the couple in the black thing. Then you have abortions and then you have which we already did in the seventh commandment religion copying cheating and so on and then finally you have which nobody in our class does watch pornography we are all good guys so there is pornography there and pornography we have already done with deacon ivan how badly it affects society and affects other people so these are just a few pictures i put up here if I had to put all the sins, there would be never this whole PPT would be I mean covered up. We have so many sins, so many quite sins that we have. Okay, next. So way back in 1958 was Pope Pius XII, and he was very strict, a very strict Pope actually. He um, a very very strict, very intelligent man, and he was fighting against what is known as rel relativism. Relativism is like if I think it's right, it's right. What's your problem? And if you think it's wrong, it's your problem. Okay. And the world can't function like that. And so he said the greatest sin in the world today 
is a loss of the sense of sin. You ask people today, come for confession, what sins did I commit? Yeah, what sins did I commit? Because you have lost the sense of sin. You don't know that you're hurting yourself. It's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, come on, I'll give you a checkup for cancer. Oh, I'm perfect. I've got no cancer. But you don't have the tumor that's growing inside. You don't have the bitterness that can cause that tumor and so on. Okay, next. And Pope Benedict XVI, who's still living, said, the truth is not decided by popular opinions because of relativism. Is homosexuality, same-sex marriage is okay? 100% will say yes. 99 will say no, therefore 100 is more, therefore same sex is okay. That's not the way how God works. When there are truths, the truth does not change. The truth does not change with opinions. Because if the truth had to change by opinions, the world would be in a total chaos. And that is what is happening right now. A total chaos. There's not one stream, track, line, etc. You're doing your thing, I'm doing my thing. You don't interfere with me, get lost, etc. And this is what is happening. Popular, the truth is not decided by popular opinion. You remember, Pilate makes fun of Jesus and says, what is truth? Because the Pharisees and the scribes are saying, crucify him. The others are shouting, Barabbas, the third lot are keeping quiet, and so on. And Pilate in his wisdom, very clever man, takes that water and washes his hands and says, I'm not doing anything. That's another opinion, fourth opinion. I'm not getting involved. Okay, that's also wrong. So truth is not decided by popular opinion, which at the moment is happening a lot in our country. You know how much of problems there are because people just decide who's got the money. And if you have the money, your case goes through. So that is something like that. So Pope Benedict and Pope Francis says we need to decide what God wants of us. Okay, so I'm going to change. Next slide. I'm going to talk about something that is called DOSE, D-O-S-E. There are certain chemical neuro uh, chemistry or neuroscience uh, uh, chemicals in your brain that decide, they're called neurotransmitters, that help your brain to feel good. Okay, so you have heard so often of dopamine. You go on a you go. Can you click the picture? Okay. You go on a giant wheel. Your dopamine increases. You eat chocolate. Your dopamine increases. And so you got all the different kind of happy hormones. Okay. I put put the dose D O S E dopamine, oxyto, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Okay. And all these are happy things that make you happy. And among them, that oxytocin is. One of the most important, when you learn to forgive, when you learn to forgive those hormones in your brain, trigger of happiness. Today, doctors are finding out that when you're, especially cancer patients, if you are angry and bitter and sadness and you hold so much of grudge, your cancer cells grow faster. See, God in his wisdom knew that forgiveness helps us to grow. Okay? So you've got these happy cells. That are, so for Forgiveness triggers of oxytocin, and it has been proved that once you begin to forgive, your love life increases. Your love life increases. You know, St. Augustine made a big comment once upon a time, and he said, our hearts were made for you, O Lord, but they will never find rest until they rest in you. Okay, we sing that in the hymn. The exact word was, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. And that is why people have anxieties and tension and stress. It's restless because our hearts are not in the proper place. We are still grumbling and comparing and so on. As I said in the beginning, comparison, how he's got that, how she's got that, how he can do that, how I cannot do that. What's all this all about? And then your brain trans neurotransmitters do not send happiness is sending you kind of bitterness and anger and so on. And by the way, the less you're happy, the older you look. You begin to get wrinkles and so on. Honestly, check it out. Okay, see some people are, you can see so many people are so full of life and they don't even look their age. And so these are the happy hormones. 
Uh, these happy hormones are created by God. And God has showed us one way. If you really want happiness, you need to forgive. Okay, next. So this is an article that you can check in from Pennsylvania where they're found with using these hormones. Forgiveness is a character, strength, that process, and process that when practiced is associated with improvement of what? Okay, so they've done a study of how forgiveness helps you. It improves your psychological well-being, physical health, outcomes, and longevity. That's what I said. You live longer, you look younger. Forgiveness can serve as a protective factor that buffers against poor health and psychological consequences. So your, your health improves. The benefit of forgiveness, however, are more significant for the individual who has been transgressed, the one who's hurt. is It's more important for the one who has hurt to forgive than the transgressor. Okay, next. Okay. And now by not forgiving, the same study, Okay, the same side. By not forgiving, there is hate and resentment that have unpredictable outcomes. And you ruminate. I, I don't know if you ruminate, but sometimes I have. Why did he say that? How could he say that? Did he know the whole picture? And it's going on and on, that same kind of movie clip in your mind. And you try to get out of it and back again it comes because you have resentment. Okay, and the moment you say, okay, Lord, I'll give it to you. It's your problem. I'm handing it over to you, Lord. It just gets diminished. If you don't forgive, there's anxiety and depression, elevated by blood pressure, vascular resistance, decreased immune responses, worse outcomes of cor coronary artery diseases, heart problems. Practicing forgiveness enables a transgressed individual to reduce their engagement in rumination, in reducing and thinking of it again and again. So forgiveness then is a pathway to psychological well-being and health outcome. Now, this is done by the University of Pennsylvania. And if you go onto the net and you look at forgiveness and health, forgiveness and well-being, you will see a thousand of these things popping up, all organizations that are not talking about God. They are talking about how forgiveness helps you to grow. And that is so important because Jesus introduced the sacrament of forgiveness. Okay, next. So you know that in any time that Jesus did a healing, he would say, your sins are forgiven, like the man who was lowered from the roof. And everybody asks, so what is he talking about? His sins are forgiven. And Jesus asks him, what is easy to say? Sins are forgiven? Or make this man walk? And to prove that I can show you that sins can be forgiven, tell that man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And chup chup, everybody was there. If you've seen the movie, that uh, serial Unchosen, watch that scene. Everybody's just standing there, mouths open as this man just walks through. Nobody's saying, hello, you have to pay for the damage of my roof. You made a hole in my roof and brought me down. No one is saying a thing. Everyone is stunned because that man's sins are forgiven and he moves on. Same with the woman with 12 years of hem hemorrhage and so on. Today, you can check this out. I have two cousins in the United States. Both are doctors. One is in Florida, down this side, and one is in California. And the moment one of the conditions of the paper and they're filling up is to know your religion. Yeah. They want to know in case you're know, dying or something, last sacraments and so on. And these doctors, majority of them have said, the moment they're going to do a major surgery and they know you're a Catholic, they will ask you, have you made your confession? Not to scare you that you're going to die on this uh, operation table. No, because with forgiveness, and if you are at peace, your healing of your surgery is faster and quicker and better. Okay, you can check that out also on research studies. Okay, so I'm not making all this up. This is from the different studies that are done. Next. Okay. So we come to this guy, very famous guy, Stephen Covey, and he has the seven habits of effective people. Okay, so how to be an effective person, time management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the last few years, Stephen Covey has introduced one more thing, uh, click on um, spiritual intelligence. So you have, you already heard in college and so on, multiple intelligence. So IQ is not so important. 
there's MQ, okay? You can have uh, sports in your quotient, music quotient, okay, all these kind of things. Like why Tendulkar could fail his SSC exam and yet be such a rich man? Because he has sports equia quotient, SQ, another kind of SQ, okay? So there are people like this. Uh, Oprah Winfrey has a fantastic show. She's not highly intelligent. She reads, but she's got a very high EQ. She knows how to deal with people and so on. But the uh, Covey, Stephen Covey founder, there's still something missing. And that's missing is spiritual caution. So in this spiritual caution, he doesn't talk about God per se. He talks about the higher being. Do you have this higher being in your process? I don't know if you have seen on the on your WhatsApp this new thing in from Japan, Ikagili or something like that. Do you have a purpose in life? Are you moving towards one particular goal at the end of your life? Can you say you have achieved this? Like St. Paul says, I forget what lies behind me and I run towards the goal, a crown which is unperishable and I leave everything behind and I trade myself for that goal. And so sp Stephen Covey says that is known as spiritual quotient. Do you have something in the higher realms that directs you and guides you. That's what's important. And so today, it's all about like making the money and so on and so on. You find so many people so rich and yet not happy because they're missing out on the SQ. And this is not something new. Jesus has been talking about this for years. Okay, right from the turn of, of the, uh, from the, I mean, 2000 years before. And Jesus has been talking about these things. It's only psychologists are putting it together and putting it together this way and that way. And that's what's making it sense. But if you see, if we have a God factor in our minds and a God that cares for me, I can be even a sharper and a more energetic person in life. So I've given you the psychological background of why we need forgiveness and how forgiveness brings healing okay so let's go to the next slide so jesus said i've come not for the righteous but for sinners and many people don't come for confession because what, what will the priest say i'm a great sinner there is no great sinner jesus has seen it all we priests have seen it all there's nothing exciting in the confessions at all. Like, oh, you did that. Oh, oh, no, no, no. There's nothing of that sort anymore. Okay. We've heard it all. We are not scandalized and not shocked. But more than important thing is that Jesus came to call sinners. And that was his whole mission. And if Jesus also said when that woman was caught with adultery, and it's a fun time, that's another, another lovely painting you must watch uh, of Jesus bending down with this women and all the rich guys in purples and reds in front of a great building are standing there and one man in red is turning and the other man is catching his shirt saying, hey don't go because jesus said if any one of you who is brought out sin cast the first stone and that man is turning to go because he's admitting in public that he's a sinner and the others are trying to still stop and they are not sinners but their conscience pricks them so that is why none of us can say we are holy enough. None. Even the greatest of saints would still need the grace of God to get into heaven because grace comes from God. Some of the great saints would try to make many confessions in a week because they hurt God or because of guilt. I love God so much, but then if this is going to come in the way of God and me, I want to get rid of it. So it's not the number of confessions you make but it is how much and what depth you make your confession to come back to God. All right, we priest, all of us priests, we have once a month a meeting. Now with the lockdown, we have had um, um, meetings online, okay, on Zoom meetings. But still some of us are going from one parish to our spiritual director, taking an Ola, making our confession. So most of us priests all over Bombay make our confession once a month, okay, on the first Thursday of the month, because none of us can actually preach at the Mass. We're not free to speak. There's a kind of a block. And so we need to be free with the Holy Spirit to flow through us, to talk about God. And that is why even if you're a priest and even the Pope, 
I've got a picture somewhere here where the Pope is making his confession in public. Why? Because he is a sinner. That's what he told people. In all the youth, world youth days, he goes right in front where all the youth are chatting and he asks for a kneeler. He sits there, stands, tells the priest, you are my confession. And all the youth look at him and say, I think the Pope is making his confession. Yeah, because all of us need God's grace. Okay, next. Okay, so now every sacrament has a scripture base. All right, so what is the scripture base here? And the scripture base is John chapter 20 in the Bible. John chapter 20. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is in the upper room. And Jesus enters the upper room and he says, peace be with you. And after that, when the latter part of that same gospel, again he says, peace be with you. And then he says, I am sending you. Okay, that, and he breathes on them. What is breath? Breath is life of God. Ruha, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit in uh, Greek, in Hebrew, is called Ruha. So God breathes into them the Holy Spirit. That's why he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Adam received the Holy Spirit. When you are baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. When you were born, your first breath that you took was a gift of the Holy Spirit. And God reminds them, the apostles, receive the Holy Spirit. If you have forgiven anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. See the authority God gives the apostles and the apostles to the laying of hands, give it to the priest. That is why every priest doesn't say, I'm forgiving you, but I forgive you in the name of Jesus, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I cannot forgive your sins, but Jesus can forgive your sins. And there are times when Jesus says, if they are not forgiven, then they are not forgiven. When? We will do that when you come to the content, matter, and form. All right? When can a priest refuse to give you absolution? So you have scripture base. I remember to write this down. One of my favorite questions is matter and form and so on. So scripture base is John 20, 21. You don't have to remember totally. But if you remember, it's in the upper room. And Jesus gives them this power to forgive. That's more than enough. Okay? So... What exactly is sin? Next slide. What exactly is sin? And sin is basically, picture, sin is basically a broken relationship. Okay? It's a broken relationship. We have done it so often. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. We have done what a relationship with son and father, God and me, me and my others, others and creation and so on. So when this relationship, next slide, when this relationship is broken, okay, we begin to sin. Now you know it can be broken in 101 ways. For example, cutting down trees in Goa, destroying that, that's breaking down the fifth commandment, the animals will die, pollution will increase, people will suffer, coal dust every way, etc. That's the fifth commandment. That's breaking a relationship just because of one man's greed. All right, so you have these kind of things. Look at any commandment, it's a broken relationship. And when that broken relationship is there, you're also breaking indirectly the relationship with God. So that is what sin is. And so you can't say, I have not sinned. Because if you, you have not broken a relationship, I don't know. I see people crossing the road at the wrong time. I see people crossing the road at the wrong place. That's breaking the law. I see thousands of people walking without a mask. They are causing danger to their life and to our lives also. <clears throat> Fifth commandment again. So if you look at everything, there is, I'm not saying everything is sin, but there can be broken relationships. And that's when you need to come back to God. Okay? A real conversation with God and to make your sins, uh, confess your sins. Next slide. Now, throughout the season of Advent and Lent, you will see this word metanoia. Metanoia means to turn around. Click. See? Metanoia means to turn around. It's a Greek word. Okay, And to turn around what? 
to go back to your real life, the real life with God. Okay? You hear it so often in Advent and so on. You know, next slide. When I talk to people, I look at my life, even my um, my ordination symbol was a Y, two Ys, the big Y of Yahweh and the small Y of me. But this Y has always played a very important role in my life. Because if you look at this, this is the path towards God. Click. This is the path that we go away from God. And when do we go away from God and we say, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And as you go on, click, you'll find that this distance is getting bigger and bigger. And it's so sad that some people have never kept a parallel life with God or never been in the main part of God, the big white arrow, but they're going further and further away. And then suddenly one day you'll get up and say, why isn't God hearing my prayer? Maybe God is too far. No, God is not too far. He listened to you. But you can't use God like when you want him and when you don't want him. Okay? It's not like a thing that you can use. God is a, is a one that wants relationship. And sin is basically this. When you don't make your confession, your sin accumulates. I will give an example of, say, uh, so many people in Europe or in Canada, in America. They don't go to church on a Sunday morning. Why? Oh, one Sunday we got to sleep. We had Saturday to sleep also. One Sunday to sleep, we get up late. We'll go for a meeting. We'll go for the parish mass at 12 o'clock. All parish masses at 12 o'clock in the afternoon because it's warm. So we'll go for the parish mass at 12 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, uh, no, I think we'll go for a brunch. We'll go swimming. And maybe we'll try and get an evening mass. Okay? After the evening, oh man, we're too tired. After the swim and the brunch. Uh, we, 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 yeah, never mind. We'll make it next Sunday. So if you've got forgot one Sunday, the next Sunday comes along and says, ah, we already didn't go last Sunday. What's the point of going this Sunday? We, and that's how it becomes a habit. So you miss one Sunday and then another Sunday. And, and finally, somewhere way out, suddenly your daughter or your son getting married. Oh, let's go to the church and have a wedding mass at the church and nuptials. For what? Why are you having a nuptials in the church? A hypocrite. You've never been to church, but you want to show the whole world that you're a Catholic? What is the point of that nuptial mass? A show. Because God is not in that. You've not even made your confession to come back. You know, many of my cousins called me for weddings to Canada, and I didn't go. See? Because I don't know if it's really correct to go or not to go. But I would feel very upset with celebrating a mass. When I know that there'll be people talking outside there, there'll be only the couple inside and whatever and so on. So this is exactly how sin is. It gets it slowly and surely and it gets into layers and layers, hardened layers. Okay, next. So when we look at the people of Israel, I've got to go back to history. And we look at Israel's history, the people right from the time they left Egypt, from the time they left Egypt, they were rebelling against God, the golden calf, and the uh, worship of Baal, and Asherah, and harvest festivals, prostitutes, male prostitutes, female prostitutes, temple prostitutes, homosexuality, and so on. And then God brings a nation there and straightens them out. And they say, oh my God, we're, oh my God, we got so far away, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. And then they make they repent. And after they repent, God forgives them. And then again, the division starts. Slowly, 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 other gods and so on. You know, when I look at this coronavirus, I don't think it, I don't think it's God sending it. But God has definitely given us time to pray, time to renew our life, and time to make changes, changes for the better. Everybody saying, Oh, I'm hope we're getting back to normal. Normal is not normal. You cannot afford to go back to that kind of life again. God has given you a chance to renew yourself, to grow, to be better, to be more educated, to be more loving, to be forgiving. How much of time we spend with the family, with rubbing shoulders and getting irritated and forgiving and loving. That's the new norm. That's the new normal. Not going back and say, oh, now we can go out and have parties and so on. No. 
I think God is a message in all this virus thing, you know. I'm not saying God punished us, but I'm saying there is a lesson to learn from all this and a lesson to be better than what you were before the virus. To be a better, you. how many of us, as for, as for me, I have learned to be more patient. I didn't have patience at all. I would get a little irritated and so on. But here is like, so what can I do about it? Nothing. Okay, so let's take a book. Let's do some drawing. Let me look at the window out here and draw trees and leaves and so something which I never, I used to do in school, but forgot now. And so many things like that. So God in this, as a time of correcting us. Okay, next, click. So if you look at this picture, it's exactly this. That life of Israel is exactly my life. I may rebel against God, but God will send me something that I need to be disciplined or God will send me something to remind me he may correct me. Oh, yeah, I might see an incident of someone my age dying of cancer. Or I might see someone dying because of something. Say, oh, my God, this man is the same age as me. And am I ready to go to go, uh, die right now? Oh, no, not not. So there may be an incident that I see somewhere as a witness or something like that. But I am shaken out of my boots. And then I repent. Okay. And then it's not so easy. Because after I repent, habits die hard. So I need to tell myself. Okay, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do this again and make a schedule and try your best again. Are you going to succeed? No, you'll fall, but you won't fall so deep. You will fall, but you'll get up again faster than what you did before. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is what stages of changes that take place. Another psychological thing. Basically, in the beginning, like most people, I don't want to go to confession. Yeah, that's the first thing. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to go to for tuition classes. Okay, but then somebody may say, why don't you try it? Okay, I may try it, but I will. I may try it. Okay, so now the idea has got in. Then I will try. And once you start trying, the preparation starts beginning. And then once you go, you start making changes in your life. And gradually a new habit is formed. Okay, check that out. There has to be a kind of, as I told you, an SQ and a purpose at the end of the life. If I go to the gym at my age, what am I going to for to develop muscles? Who's going to see an old man with muscles and panty and all and muscles? Nobody's interested. Okay, that's not so. That's not a motivation factor for me. Maybe my diabetes will be better under control. Yeah, so maybe that. But I'm not going to the gym for just like that. But I, so people say go to the gym. No, 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 no. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is here is that. There are stages and you'll go through the stages and going to the stages is the process of growing. Okay. All right. Next. Okay. So the matter that we have okay, um, is sin, committed and contriteness. Okay. Uh, just one minute. Yeah. The mat. So we done the the scripture base, John twenty twenty one. The matter, the matter for reconciliation is our sins committed and contriteness. I remember what I was talking about earlier. Okay, if I am not sorry for my sins, and I just go and make a confession, then it's pointless. I have to have contriteness. So therefore, I need to spend time. Look at my sin. There are some people who say, uh, I know I made a mistake, but I'm not sorry. Then those sins are not counted at all. What God wants is to see a contrite heart. Sacrifices I don't want. What makes me happy, God says, is a contrite heart. A heart that says, I'm truly sorry. I'm truly sorry. Okay? And when you're truly sorry, you know what it is to be like this man in his hands, head in his hands, knows. He says, how could I do this? How could I reach that? Those are regrets. Then when he gets up, he'll be sorry and makes a contriteness, repentance. So there are regrets and there's repentance. So you have a choice. All of us have regrets. All of us have regrets. Okay. And the other day I caught a young fellow outside uncle's kitchen and he was smoking weed. And when he saw me, he coughed to death. And he said, Father, I'm so sorry I tried this cigarette out. 
That's regret. Repentance is, I'm not going to do it again. I nearly died, okay, smoking that thing. That is the difference. One is regret and one is repentance. And when repentance comes, when you're really, really sorry. It's not like the little child who says, okay, mama, I'm sorry. No. You're so sorry that sometimes you may even want to say like, uh, I, don't want the, I don't want this biscuit or I don't want this cookie as your reward. And the mother says, come on, I've forgiven you. But you're so hurt and that's what's important, to be contrite before God. Okay? God has been so good to us. And then we just can't take things for granted. You know, there has to be some sense of, I need to love God and to ask Him for His forgiveness. So that is the matter, the sin committed and contriteness, not just a list of sins. And the form is what the priest will say uh, after he gives you confession. Here's your sins, okay? So if you see the next slide, it says, God the Father of mercy. Next slide. To the death and resurrection of His Son has reconciled the world to Himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins through the ministry of the church, not my ministry, to the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon, not Father Michael, Father Clifton, Father whatever. May God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins in what? In the name of the Father. I don't absolve it in my own name. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father. Very important. It's not sign of the cross name of the Father. That name there is on behalf of God, on behalf of Jesus. Which Jesus already said in John 20, if you forgive sins in my name, they'll be forgiven. That's what it is. Not just the sign of the cross. It's so important. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father. Some of you have come to me for confession. And I've always said, I absolve you, Abel. Or I absolve you. Rebecca, from your sins, I made it a little more personal so that you will understand that it is God who's forgiving you your sins. So that is why it's so important. Now you know the matter of the form and you know the uh, matter form and the scripture base. Now you're going to see a video by a very famous priest who's very good with the youth about picture, about how to make a confession. Only God can forgive sins. But then Jesus gave his power of forgiveness to some pretty ordinary guys. This is really important. Jesus gave us the sacrament of reconciliation because he knew that we would need it. Sometimes it's easy to overlook this. Sometimes we can imagine that God said, okay, I'm going to give you this sacrament of forgiveness, but I'll be very, very disappointed if you ever actually need it. That would make no sense. Jesus gave us the sacrament of reconciliation because he knew that we would sin, he knew we would fall, he knew that we would need it. So how do we go? First thing to do, make an examination of your conscience. Basically look at your life and say, where have I said, God, I know what you want me to do, but I want to do what I want to do? And make a list. You can take 10 minutes and do this really quickly. The second thing, get in here. Sometimes people say, I don't want to go to confession because it's been so long, I won't know what to do. Well, the priest, he went to school for this. He knows how it's supposed to go. So all you have to do, get in confession and say, Father, it's been a while, I'm not sure what to do next. And he'll walk you through it. Sometimes people are afraid though. What if the priest remembers what I say? What if he thinks poorly of me? I remember he used to ask priests that same question. Like, Father, do you think kind of badly of me? And he would always say, well, I don't even remember sins after you've gone to confession. I thought it was really nice of him to say. I didn't believe him. But now that I'm a priest, I know it's true. I rarely remember anything anyone said in confession. Priests are kind of like garbage men. They're kind of like God's garbage men. You know, if you ever talk to a garbage man and ask him, like, what's the grossest kind of garbage you've ever had to take out to the trash? They can rarely remember this because basically, once you deal with garbage a lot, they cease to be exciting. It ceases to be dramatic. It ceases to be really gross because you're used to dealing with it. The same thing is true with God's garbage men. The same thing is true with sin. 
After a while, it ceases being exciting. It ceases being gross. It just is just as what it is. It's just bad. And we take it away without being too shocked. What if a priest, you know, says what I heard in confession? There's this thing called the seal of confession, which means that if a priest ever said what he heard in confession, he would be automatically excommunicated from the Catholic Church. That's how seriously the Church takes your privacy. Sometimes people can be afraid the priest will think poorly of them for going to confession. The priest knows that everyone struggles. Everyone struggles. The fact that you're in confession is proof that you are willing to struggle for Jesus. Now, when you go to confession, one of the first things you want to do is tell the priest how long it's been since your last confession. Now, don't get too hung up on a specific date. Just give him a general sense of how long it's been um, because there's a difference. It helps the priest know what kind of advice to give. If you say it's been 10 years and I talked back to my parents once and that's all, then he can actually ask, let's, let's dive a little deeper and he can actually help you. Then you start giving your confession. Now, when we give confession, we need to actually say all of our mortal sins. Remember mortal sins? Those big deal sins. I, freely, I knew were sins and I freely chose to do them anyways. I need to confess all of those. And the church says that I need to confess them in number and in kind. Now, the number, again, don't get too hung up on being specific, but just give a general sense of how much this has been. Someone could say, well, like, I've taken the Lord's name in vain 88 times. I mean, 89 times. I mean, 87 times. I don't know. You could just say, I've taken the Lord's name in vain a lot. Again, it's the same kind of thing. Someone could say, well, you know, I stole something from work once and I've been taking something home from work the last number of weeks, the last number of months. There's a difference in that kind of thing. So make sure you say that. And also what kind of sin it is. Now there's two traps people can fall into. They can either be way too general about what kind of sin it is or they can be way too specific about what kind of sin. I need to name the sin. I have an older sister and she once told me I could tell you this story. She said that she went into confession once and she said, Father, one through ten. And the priest stopped and one, one through ten what? And she's kind of brassy. She says, well, one through the commandments, have you heard of them? <laughs> and he said, well, have you killed someone? No. Have you committed adultery? I have not. She needs, we need to name the sin. Um, a priest friend of mine says this when it comes to having to include all the necessary details. He's a priest friend from Kenya and he said, don't go into confession and say, Father, I stole a rope and forget to mention that there was a cow attached to the rope. So I can be way too general. I also can be way too specific. I don't need to tell the story of the sin. Someone could go into confession and say, well, Julie and I have been best friends ever since first grade when Mr. Johnson put us in the third row together, except for the brief time in eighth grade when we weren't friends because she did this and I did this, she did this. But ultimately, I gossiped about Julie behind her back. All you have to do is go into confession and say, I gossiped about my best friend. We just need to name the sin in number and in kind and let the Lord's mercy and love transform us. Now, I need to confess all my mortal sins. But remember, there's two kinds of sins, moral and venial. Those venial sins that wound our relationship with the Lord, those are great to bring to the Lord in confession as well because it's all about healing that relationship. When it comes to mortal sins, they all need to be confessed because remember, relationship. To hold on to some mortal sins and not hand them over is like trying to come back to the Lord without really coming back. Sometimes people are afraid because they can't tell the difference between a temptation to sin and an actual sin. Remember, a sin has to actually be chosen by you. It's something you have to will, something you have to grab onto and say, I want this as my own. A lot of times we experience temptation, temptation to act, temptation to think, and that's not a sin. In fact, those temptations have no ability to hurt you until we choose them. So the difference between a temptation and a sin is all about whether or not we're willing to choose it or not choose it. Now, when you come to confession, so a lot of times you have the opportunity to go either behind the screen or face to face. Both are perfectly fine because you know that in both, you can completely trust the priest to extend the mercy of Jesus to you. I know sometimes people will stay away from confession because they feel like they say, I don't feel bad enough for my sins. I don't feel sorry enough for my sins. Well, that's the difference between regret and repentance. Regret is when we feel sorry for our sins. Repentance is actually making a decision to say, I'm going to turn away from my sins and turn back to Jesus. We don't need regret, but we do need repentance. It's the difference between Judas and Peter. Both men betrayed the Lord. Both of them regretted their sin. They both felt bad. They both went into the darkness of the night and wept for their sins. But only Peter had repentance, where he turned away from his sin and he turned back to Jesus. Think about what it would be like if Judas did not only regret his sin, but actually turned away from his sin and turned to the Lord. We'd be celebrating Mass in the church of St. Judas the Repentant. 
I often ask a person who says they don't feel sad enough, I say, is there any small part of you that wants the freedom and the forgiveness that Jesus offers? If there is, then you can go to confession. As you continue to journey toward the Sacrament of Confirmation, the Sacrament of Reconciliation is wide open to you. Before and after confirmation is a normal part of our lives. Because we realize this, confession is always a place of victory. It's a place where Jesus always gets the win. The purpose of your life and the goal of your life is to be a saint. The Sacrament of Reconciliation is where saints are made. Okay, so now when you've already seen the video, the detailed video, the stages of reconciliation are one, preparation stage. You recall your sins. You find the root cause of your sin. You be sorry for what you have done. Not guilt, not regret, but sorry. Then you go to the priest and you go and make a confession. So often people say, I'm going for confession. No, it's the sacrament of reconciliation. Confession is one part of the sacrament of reconciliation. And then you say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And it's so many days from my last confession, or maybe six months from my last confession, because then the priest can gauge your spiritual life. When you go to the doctor and you talk to the doctor, he wants to know when was your last appointment. And with a disappointment, and now your sugar level has gone up, or your pressure has gone down. What is it that has made over the years, it, uh, times you can calculate? the process of what's happening. The same with your spiritual life. The priest can make out whether you are growing in spirituality or just degenerating and so on. And so that is why when you come to make your confession, you recall your sins. Many people just rattle out their sins without even knowing what they are doing. Fortunately, every year when we have our confessions for confirmation and we will do this whole thing again in the church, before you go to talk to the priest, all the priests have come from out say, you know, Father, the confessions your youth made are amazing. They're really taught of the sins that are committed. Because I'll, I will give you a questionnaire, eh, which is for you or yourself, and you take it off. And that is quite detailed. And it's better to purge, remove everything out. You know, when you have cancer, the doctor doesn't cut the top of the tumor. He purges it, he cleans it thoroughly. And that is what is important. So you make a thorough confession. You just squeeze everything out and let it just come out so that yourself is clear and clean. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit comes and fills that empty space. Because if that empty space is not empty totally, you've heard in the Bible, not one devil comes in, a legion comes in. A legion comes in. That's what Jesus says. In this kind of case, when you clear everything and you're not very sorry, a legion will come in. So your next confession will be even more difficult. So that is why you need to make a thorough confession. Don't worry about how many sins you have or whatever, but you need to make a confession. And after you can make your confession, listen to the confessor because he is not going to talk on his own accord. God is speaking to him. In one of my cases when I was sitting there for confession, I told that person, I don't know what, I have a feeling you're not telling me all your sins. There is this one sin that you have that's called, I feel it is, you had a mistress. And he nearly fell off the stool. He said, yes, Father, I could have a mistress. I said, I, I, I don't know how it came to me, but that's how God tells us sometimes. You're not telling me everything, okay? Another time, and the person was saying, I can't sleep and I cannot do this. I said, Are you sure you don't have an in uh, idle a goddess in your room. And after five minutes, he said, yes, Father, I got one Nataraj. Okay? So sometimes God prompts us to help that person, not to catch you. God loves you so much that he tells this priest, hello, tell him that. When you go to Potar and Tabor, there are people who can tell you what sins you have forgotten to tell. Why? To tell God, to consider you a liar? No. To make sure that you make a thorough confession. So there are kind of people, like that's what you call in the Holy, when you go for charismatic meetings, they say, gift of the spirit, gift of tongues, okay? There are different gifts, okay, of discernment. Those are the gifts that are put into practice. They can tell you, you have not told me everything. There is this, this, this. There are people who are, have the gifts of God. And then you make an act of contrition. Okay, next. 
And then that's the picture I was talking to you about Pope Francis making his confession in public. Okay, so then you go back and do your penance. Now your penance is not just three Hail Marys and so on. Your penance is a symbol of what you're going to do to repair that damage. To repair that damage. Suppose the doctor tells you that you've got a boil on your foot, on your ankle. Put this medicine. Fine, you go up and put the medicine. But will you walk and run up and down the stairs? No. The medicine is just one thing. Walking and running up the stairs. Ah, I got the medicine. I put the medicine. I'm fine. No. The penance is a symbol of what you're going to do to repair that wrong. So in that penance, you'll also think about, why did I talk about so-and-so person? I'm not going to talk about this person again. If that person's name appears in my life, I'm going to say no. Okay? I don't want to talk about it. Now, when you go for confession, you get two graces. Actual grace, that God is actually cleaning all your sins. And sanctifying grace is when God's going to give you that grace to strengthen your decisions. So, so often we hear confession, there are people who you say, now go back to your place and say a prayer. Within five minutes after confession, they're out on the road, talking to everybody again. No, you're receiving sanctifying grace at that moment. It's like somebody just painted a, a garden bench and instead of you waiting for that paint to dry, you've sat on the bench. It's like that. Sanctifying grace needs you to be in a silence and listen and say, God, okay, I need this grace. I know this, this, this is my problem. I know my comparisons. Uh, this is what is causing me. Oh, I know that person when I see, I talk, I grumble about that person. Oh, when I'm alone at home and the TV is on and a computer, I switch on to pornography and so on. Okay, so Lord, I'm not going to be alone in the home. Oh, I'm not going to keep anything like that in front. You know, if you come to my room here, you'll see the statue of Our Lady in front of the screen. Okay, and with this Our Lady in front of the screen, I, I dare not see any pornography. How can I see pornography with this thing in front of my screen? Okay, so I show you to come to my room. See what I've done here. I don't want to see things which are not proper of God. Okay, I don't want to see anything which is not proper of God on my pit table whenever I'm writing on so on this crosses there. So I have made decisions. I have made decisions to make sure that that's grace, sanctifying grace is there. It's like baking a cake. You can put all the mixture in the oven and say, okay, I'm not putting the oven on. Don't expect a cake. So the same thing is you got to do certain things to make sure that sanctifying grace is absorbed, it's sunk, it's into your being. Okay? So that is it. And then you will experience this God's love and healing. And then you make your resolution. I am going to say my rosary every day. And I'm going to fix a time to say my rosary. If you see my alarm clock at 10.45, the alarm goes every day. It's time for my rosary. You have a you have a smartphone. You have a uh, kind of a, a phone to remind you of alarms and so on. Why don't you put that alarm on? I say, this is the time of my prayer. And tell people, I'm sorry. I need to go and say my prayer this time. Okay. I have a lamp for my medicines. I have a lamp for my prayers. And so that is why I, it's my resolution because I'm so busy the whole day with different activities. 10.45 is my rosary time. Okay. So something like that. Next. Okay. So I'm not going to do all the 10 commandments. I'm just going to show you slide by slide fast because you have already done this. So we just, I'm just going to say, you look at it and I'm going to say next. Okay, so next. Okay, next. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Next. So you know the way we have already done this commandment too with you. Next. Next, next. Okay, so this is just an example of John Lennon, who used God's name badly, okay, and he uh, said, I don't know if you must have seen this story on WhatsApp because I have this long ago. Now everything's on WhatsApp. So made fun of Jesus Christ. He said they are more famous than Jesus Christ. Hardly six months later, he was shot six times. Okay, the next person also, if you see, next. The next person said, even God cannot stop me from being president. 
as he was climbing up the stairs to take the vow, a vote, uh, the oath of presidency, he had a heart attack and he died. Okay, so you can't use God's name and make fun of God's name. Same with the Titanic. They said, not even God, next, not even God can sink the Titanic. And you and I know what happened to the Titanic. So when you take God's name in vain and you think you're better than God, sometimes some things don't work. Okay, next. Okay, next. Okay, third commandment is keep holy the Sabbath. So you need to go to all the reasons for keeping holy the Sabbath. Next. So I'm not going to go through this, the various questions here. We do that at the end in January to see, to make a thorough confession. Next. Unworthy communions. Now communions will start again. You need to make a confession because you've not made a confession right from March. There's a lot of sins you've accumulated. Okay, you've been distracted with online masses. All that has to be spoken to before you can even receive communion. Okay, next. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord. This is the only commandment that has the blessings. Okay, so you have done this commandment already. Next. So you know your parents, etc. So we'll go to the next commandment. Okay, have I been disobedient, etc., etc., etc. Next. These are children who have been forced by their parents to do, perform, and so on against their will. And so many of these children, okay, maybe some of you fall in this category. Every time a family, somebody comes home, some of your dad and mom says, okay, son, just play a little song for you, your uncle and auntie and so on. And so your parents don't respect you at all. And therefore, you will also grow to not respect them. So that's the duty of the parents. Next. Okay. Then you shall not murder. We have done this umpteen times with, with pollution, nature, and so on. Okay. We've done about abortions where God gives life. Next. Okay. So we've done that where God gives life to you. Abortions, euthanasia, we have done that. <coughs> you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor that's telling lies, which Arlenas did very well about testimonies and lies and so on and covetousness. Okay, next. Thou shalt not commit adultery, that all of you know what it is about. Okay, then uh, <coughs> next. Okay, so we know we are created and equal dignity and respect is required. Okay, we also know that. Next. We also know about uh, artificial uh, contraceptives, etc. Okay, next. Next, 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 next. All these things you're well versed in and you know what's wrong here, the whole thing. Okay. All right. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, be jealous, envy of your neighbor's house. Next. Okay, so there's all these questions we'll ask you to look into in January. Okay. Next. Next. You shall not steal. If you see that picture there, someone stolen the letters of that board. Okay. So, next. Okay. So, general principles. Taking something away from another person as regarding stealing. Okay. Next. Let's go down to even not stealing animal fur. Next. Next. Okay. So, stealing from animals and environment and so on. Okay. Next. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Okay, capital sins, I think uh, Linus has already done with you. So there is no need for me to do the capital sins. But we just go fast to the first sin is pride. Next. The next is pride. Okay, you got here Serena looking very arrogant. Okay, next sin, I'm superior. Okay, avarice when you greed for material things. Nothing is good enough for you. You still want to buy and buy and buy. Thanks to Amazon and all that, um, it's becoming much easier, but we are buying things which are not required. Next. So you have envy, 
this picture you already saw of that young girl who's feeling jealous that her boyfriend's kissing the other person. A poor thing. Anyway, and that's why we say green with envy and so on. But envy is to want something which you don't have and uh, quite different from jealousy. Okay? So you're making comparisons. Next, you have anger. Everybody knows about anger. Uh, how we get angry so fast. It goes against our whole body systems. It, they, they have psychosomatic diseases and so on. Um, you look horrible when you get angry. The next, when you get angry, you're looking so horrible because there's bloodshot in your eyes, dilated nostrils. You look like a kind of an animal because we are still in that instinctive body the big eyes means you're angry and your firm jaw and your teeth come out and things like that. And you look very, very horrible. And the only way to make that other person more angry is to take a photograph and send it to him later. So it's sure to get more angry with you. Okay, next. We have already done about lust with the sixth and the ninth commandment. Next. Yeah. Okay, so different between love and lust. You have done that, so it's good. All those are boyfriend, girlfriend, gluttony. Yeah. Number of french fries in your mouth as if there's no time for tomorrow. Okay. Next, slot, which is laziness and sleeping and untidiness goes with slot. Okay. And my more, okay. Next. Okay. Here's another painting, which I'm going to end with. It is another painting of Michelangelo. Okay, Michelangelo painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And this painting is the painting called The Last Judgment. So do you remember when I did with you the election of the Pope and all the cardinals have to go up and hold the paper, that ballot paper up to God and you can see there right in the center is God or Jesus Christ angry. He's like, I'll show you guys, like hand is up there like that. And all around Jesus on the left and right are saints. All the saints who have survived and worked hard. Okay, Above Jesus are two domes. All the things that Jesus suffered through. You can see the scourging at the pillar, the pillars there. And how many people are saved in that dome up there because Jesus was scourged. And you have the cross and then you have the nails and so on. What I'm more concerned is, okay, the painting has uh, one, two, three, four, five different layers. So the first layer is the dome. Second layer is Jesus and all the saints. And if you look closely, you see some saints have certain things in their hands because they were martyred because accordingly and so on. Uh, if you ever you go to Rome, it'll be nice if you can see this painting. And from the man who's sitting on a cloud is a cloth hanging. In that cloth is the painting of Michelangelo. Because Michelangelo wants to say, I also want to be in heaven. Okay. And then comes this great chasm where you hear in the Bible that story at the bosom of Abraham. There's a great chasm dividing us. You cannot come to us and we cannot go to you. And that chasm is shown here as a big river. And in between are people right now who have to, and either maybe in purgatory or whatever, either they're going up to heaven or they're going down. And both two paintings that every time I go and see this painting, what scares me is that man sitting there with regrets and the other man right down where the devil is going to whack the daylights out of them because you chose to come to hell. Now, very well behave. And we think hell is going to be good fun, but see the devil's out to attack him. So if you see the next picture, you'll see a close up of Jesus. Mary's there and all of them are there around the place. Um, these are the saints, okay? And the next one, if you see the painting, next is that man. Oh, I don't want to be this man. She's I, like, oh, what the hell did I do? How could I do this thing? And there are two devils holding him by the leg to pull him down, okay? And on the other side, there are trumpets. There are somebody else going up to heaven, but I am going down to hell. See, the devil pulling me down and all I can do is just say what's the point of all my muscles and parties and gyms and all that kind of thing. See the eyes of a sleepless man and the fingers there. This, this part of the painting scares me like 
hell. Yeah, hell, sorry, play on the word. But scares me crazy because I don't want to be that man, okay? That man who's there. Okay, next. And that is the other painting, just below that, is these guys who are being shipped off to hell. And you can see the devil there with his uh, O whacking them, make them get out of the boat and get into hell. And you can see the man in the right, the snakes all around him. Okay. And if you see above the O, there's another devil pulling another person down. Okay. So, and then on the right-hand side on top, there are other men. There's a chap there with a black swim trunk falling out of heaven. Okay. Something or the other. So I don't want to be in the lower half of that painting. No way. I want to be somewhere up in the middle. So that is why I need to make my confession regularly. Okay. So we come back to last picture. We come back to the scene of prodigal son. I have a choice. I always have a choice to be like that man who thinks everything is right and standing on a pedestal, the elder brother. Or oh, I can be like that man sitting and says, ah, these things don't bother me. I've got enough of philosophy of life. I am okay. See, he's got a philosopher's cap on him, sir. I don't have to bother. I'm okay. Or I can be like the prodigal son on my knees, broken, stinking, smelling, sweaty, lice in my hair and whatever. But I come back and kneel down before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. So close your eyes, please. And I'm going to say a prayer from the book of Tobit. Listen to the prayer slowly. Exalt me before every living be being because he is your Lord and God. Our Father and God forever and ever. He will afflict you for your iniquities but will have mercy on all of you. When you turn back to him with all your heart, and with all your soul, and do what is right before him, then he will turn to you, and will hide his face from you no longer. Now consider what he has done for you, and give thanks with full voice. Bless the Lord of righteousness, and exalt the King of ages. According to your heart, do what is right before him. Perhaps there will be pardon and no pardon for you. As for me, I exalt my God. My soul exalts the King of heaven and rejoices all the days of my life. Let all the singing praises to his greatness. Let all of us speak and give thanks to God, the God of our Jerusalem. Thank you for listening.